everybody. Uh, I think the, as, as Anthony said, I think the power of the internet is truly amazing. I'm sitting here in Omaha. It is 2.30 in the afternoon on a bright, sunny, uh, relatively hot day, and you're approaching twilight. So I just think it's quite fascinating what we can do in 2014. Uh, as Anthony said, week one of two is going to focus on pathophysiology and diagnosis of truly two of my most favorite diseases. I think I developed a love of these diseases during my final year of veterinary school where it seemed every patient assigned to me on the internal medicine service or on my critical care rotation had one or both of these diseases. So I was simply fascinated by all, all of the ways these patients can present and truly all of the ways that they can be treated. And obviously, we're going to talk about treatment next week. This week, we get to be relatively nerdy, geeky, whatever term you want to use, and talk about pathophysiology of each of these diseases, yes, there is some overlap, but obviously there are some unique idiosyncrasies to both of them. And we are also going to spend some time reviewing how specifically to diagnose them. And it may seem intuitive at some points, but realistically, both of these diseases, but particularly IMHA, can be pretty dang tricky to accurately diagnose uh, for some patients, and we'll, we'll talk about those. We're going to start with immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, and usually when I say this disease or when I say the acronym IMHA, most of my colleagues in primary care here will admit that their heart rate goes up or they start to sweat a little bit. Uh, they become hypertensive. They just really don't like this disease because they are uncomfortable with it. And hopefully uh, by the end of these two weeks, if you do have some trepidation with approaching either types of these patients, you'll be a little bit more comfortable. We need to remember that the traditional circulating time of a red blood cell in the body is approximately 120 days. And obviously, in patients with immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, those red blood cells are removed from peripheral circulation much more rapidly. And this traditionally occurs because these red blood cells become coated with either complement or, most commonly, certain antibodies, and this is an example of a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction or antibody-mediated cytotoxicity. Everybody has heard of the terms intravascular hemolysis and extravascular hemolysis, and it is important to know the difference because some studies suggest that each has a different prognosis, and there are even some studies that have started to suggest that each should be treated a little bit differently. That evidence is weak, but nevertheless, I do feel it's important to know the difference, and it is something that I emphasize with my students. So with intravascular hemolysis, we have these individual red blood cells that become markedly coated with both immunoglobulins and with complement. And when this happens, the red blood cell membrane becomes damaged to such an extent that extravascular water enters into the cytoplasmic region, causing the red blood cells individually to swell and ultimately rupture. How do we see this clinically? Well, these aren't the patients that turn yellow. These are the patients that have a documented hyperhemoglobinemia, or most commonly you collect a sample of urine and it looks like port. Contrast that with 
extravascular hemolysis, which, by the way, is more common, at least based on the available studies. In this form of hemolysis, again, the red blood cells are individually coated with specific antibodies, and the FC component of these antibodies is bound by the FC receptor from macrophages, and these macrophages are part of the mononuclear phagocytic system, chiefly present within the spleen and the liver. We traditionally think that the antibodies are attacking adult or mature red blood cells. And so when these mature red blood cells are peripherally destroyed through either extravascular or intravascular hemolysis, we expect the bone marrow to react accordingly. The way it was explained to me uh, going through medical school in the gun-violent country that the United States is, the immune system attacking red blood cells is akin to a terrorist taking out police officers on the street. But there's no problem with the police academy. The youngins are still there ready to come out. And that is the most common form. Nothing happens to the bone marrow, but only our adult red blood cells are destroyed. That is actually not the most common thing that I see in my practice because I only see the weird ones. Primary care doctors seem capable of at least initially addressing uh, the classic forms of IMHA, so I get to see the proverbial zebras. And what I mean by that is, we are documenting more and more cases where not only is the immune system attacking peripheral red blood cells, the mature ones, but they are also attacking erythroid precursors within the bone marrow. And these are the cases that become both challenging to diagnose, but also to treat. So if we have the immune system targeting both mature erythrocytes, as well as bone marrow erythroid precursors, we are still going to see evidence of a hemolytic anemia from the mature destruction component. But because the bone marrow is involved, we will see an inappropriately poor regenerative erythroid response. And this tends to confuse a lot of people at any level of practice because we were all taught in school that IMHA should have a profoundly regenerative response. And as we're learning, that is not always the case because the bone marrow erythroid precursors can be targeted. Now, what if that immune system could care less about the adult erythroid cells? Peripheral red blood cells are not affected, but only the bone marrow erythroid precursors are targeted. For those patients, you see an absolutely non-regenerative anemia, and there is no evidence of peripheral hemolysis. Now, these are truly the cases that throw everybody for a loop, and if I'm quite honest, these are the ones that I really love because it's fun to be an investigator. So we have our first poll question, Anthony. I would like the respondents to tell me which immunoglobulin is most commonly implicated in canine IMHA. Great. I will just launch that poll. So if um, just give me a second, and we'll get that going. So which immunoglobulin is most commonly implicated in canine IMHA, is it IG, IgA, IgG, IgM, or IgE? So we'll just give people a chance to vote. I know most of you are experts on this now, so you just click on that. If, for whatever reason, there used to be iPads that it wouldn't work on, I think they do work now. So, But if you don't seem to be able to vote, if you uh, put your answer in the question box, I can... Uh, you know, certainly look at that. But this